What's up, everybody? Back with another Bible study. Today, we're getting into Numbers chapter 5. And before we get into the study, I have, I have a few things to mention. Uh, first off, prayer requests. I'll say, I'm not going to say too much about this, but uh, well, I'll, I'll say I have two prayer requests. One is my father. He was recently, uh, well, he's in a hospital, well, about to be in a hospital right now. He's at the doctor. He's been at the doctor all day waiting for transport to the hospital. Uh, they discovered an abscess, basically an infection uh, in his abdomen. And I believe it's possibly, uh, probably likely, a result of an operation he had a few days ago where I believe it was likely, uh, I don't want to say a mistake, but likely done, uh, likely happened because of that. And so he has an abscess in his abdomen and it's, uh, you know, it's very, very dangerous because the infection can spread to the, to the organs and, uh, It's uh, pretty serious, you know, so so they're waiting on transport to the hospital. Uh, they could have gone to another hospital, but they're waiting on uh, ambulance transport to a certain hospital, which has has ICU in case it ends up being serious or something, because it is can be a very serious thing in abdomen abscess. So first off, prayer request for that. If you guys can pray. For my father, his name is Darren. Pray for Darren, for that infection to be gone, for God to remove that infection completely, for him to be healed, all pain to be gone, because it's painful as well. And so first off, pray for Darren and I would also ask for that's interesting. Ten o'clock, ten thirty at night of Verizon van driving past me. But uh I would also ask um Josiah. Josiah I believe was in a serious car accident earlier. I pray for uh S ask you guys to pray for healing for him. Pray for healing for Josiah. He was in a, I believe he was in a very serious car accident earlier and uh, he could use some prayers. Both are okay from my understanding, but both could definitely use some prayers. So uh, start this video off with that. And before we get started in the study, let me preach the gospel. Everyone is going to stand before God for judgment one day. Anyone who hasn't received forgiveness of sins and been made right with God is going to be judged and thrown into the lake of fire for the second death, a body and soul, destroyed forever. This first death is just the body. Second death is body and soul, destroyed forever. God requires perfection in order to inherit eternal life, in order to be with Him in His kingdom. None of us are perfect. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's nothing we can do to earn a right standing with God, and that's why Jesus came. Jesus came 2,000 years ago, born as a human, faced temptation just like us, but lived a perfect life. Although he was perfect, didn't deserve any type of punishment, the death that he died was for us. The death that we deserve in a lake of fire for our sins, he died for us on a cross. So that through him, that death is taken away from us and we receive eternal life. Through him, our sin is taken away. And we receive his perfection that he lived out. Repent and believe the gospel. If you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins, first off, repent means to have a change of heart or a change of mind. It means to truly give your life to God. To truly make that turn to him. Make that decision and move to follow him. To turn to him. If you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And rose three days later. 
and through his sacrifice is offering you eternal life. If you believe that, and you turn to him for the forgiveness of your sins, and ask him to forgive you, you truly mean it, he will forgive you, he will give you the Holy Spirit, and he will give you eternal life. The Bible says we can't even imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Repent and believe the gospel. Give your life to Jesus today. And last thing before we get started with this video, Shabbat Shalom. Happy Sabbath or, uh, you know, Shalom means peace. Sabbath, uh, Shabbat is Sabbath. And uh, today, this evening, beginning tonight, uh, Friday evening to Saturday evening is Shabbat. It's the Sabbath. So, uh, hope you guys are resting out there, honoring God's Sabbath. Just do do no work, rest, set it apart to Him while uh, while the rest of the world is working, doing uh, their own thing. Most most of the world, at least most of most of America here, you know, Saturday is their day to uh, work around the house. To uh, many people work on Saturday, but Saturday is their day to work around the house or to go out, eat at a restaurant, have other people work for them. Shop at a store, have other people work for them. But God says set it apart. That's what holy means, set apart. And when we obey him, he blesses us. So, let's keep it holy. Let's keep the Sabbath holy. Let's rest, do no work, cause no others to do any work. Just take it easy. How hard is that? Now let's get into Numbers chapter 5. Then Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel that they send away from the camp every leper and every... And so it's going to go through different types of uncleanness and saying anyone who, who is unclean in these types of ways, in, in any of these types of ways, has to spend time outside of the camp until they were made clean again and then they can re-enter the camp because God dwells, dwells in the camp. So it command the sons of Israel that they send away from the camp every leper and everyone having a discharge and everyone who is unclean because of a dead person. You shall, and we sp spoke about these things in previous studies. You shall send away both male and female. You shall send them outside the camp so that they will not defile their camp where I dwell in their midst. The sons of Israel did so and sent them outside the camp, just as Yahuwah had spoken to Moses. Thus the sons of Israel did. Then Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel. When a man, and this is what this chapter is mainly about, the test for basically the adultery test. God set up a, a certain test, a certain way uh, to test a, a woman in a case of her, her husband ge being jealous, whether she's guilty of adultery or whether she's not. If a man was jealous, he could, uh, he would, this would happen. And the woman would be put to the test. And this was a way to deter adultery, a major way to deter adultery, which is one of the Ten Commandments. So, let's get into it. Speak to the sons of Israel. When a man or woman, and actually this is it's coming up here in a minute. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's coming up here in, here in a minute, but there's these next couple of verses, it's, uh, Just about making restitution for uh, for any sins, just more specifically any sins that you did against somebody else. But uh, but after that, we're going to get into uh, the adultery thing, the jealousy thing. Then Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, "Speak to the sons of Israel: When a man or a woman commits any of the sins of man, any of the sins of mankind." 
acting unfaithfully against Yahuwah, and that person is guilty, then he shall, it says, any of the sins, sins of mankind. It's interesting how, it, it, how that's worded uh, in regards to what it's actually speaking about. And that person is found guilty, then he shall confess his sins, which he has committed. And he shall make restitution in full for his wrong, and add one-fifth to it. So, again, this is about if somebody does somebody else wrong, somebody cheats somebody else, if somebody steals from somebody else, if somebody owes somebody else and doesn't hasn't paid them when they're supposed to, uh, they're, they're to pay back anything that they cost another person, plus one-fifth. says, then he shall confess his sins which he has committed. So that's first thing. First things first. Confess his sins which he has committed. He shall make restitution in full for his offering and add one-fifth to it. And give it to the one whom, whom he has wronged. See, God had a way of setting things right, making things right. And, you know... The law of God is so amazing, and, you know, it's, it's stuff you don't notice until you really start to study through it. Uh, but just just one example is when when two men get in a fight, or two people get in a fight. It says men. I mean, that's mostly who gets in fights. Uh, if two men get in a fight, and one hurts the other one, uh, he has to... He has to pay for his, if it hurts the other one to, to where he uh, basically is, is really injured and can't work. Uh, he has to pay for this person's wages and stay there and take care of them, take care of him. And what, what better way, what better law can there be but to make up a disagreement between, between two people if the person who hurt the other one has to take care of them while they're while they're injured, <laughs> you know, it's just so amazing. But uh, in this case, it's uh, if somebody does some, somebody, someone does something, somebody uh, else wrong monetarily in somebody in some way, he's to pay him back what he owes. Plus one fifth, plus twenty percent, in order to make it right, and give it to and give it to him whom he is wrong. But if the man has no relative to whom res restitution may be made for the wrong, so this is in the case of the person who he is wronged not being whether he is dead or not being able to be paid. Uh, he's to give it to, I, I, I believe, the closest relative. It doesn't really spe specify the closest relative here, but I believe it would be the closest relative. Uh, the closest relative would get that restitution. It says, but if the man has no relative to whom the restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution which is made for the wrong must go to Yahuwah, must go to the Lord. For the priest, beside the ram of atonement, by which atonement is made for him. So there, there would also be a ram, and I believe, if I remember right, and this is why we have to uh, truly study the Word of God. We have to truly uh, study His law to understand these things and to remember them. But if I remember right, uh, the ram was offered as, in the case of a peace offering. So in this case, it says it, it says beside, besides the ram of atonement. And yeah, I believe well, I, well rams I actually could be offered for. Uh, it says ram of atonement. I, I believe rams could be be offered. Uh, you know what? Let me just go back to it real quick, so I don't misquote it. One second.
He's trying to get over here to Leviticus. Okay, so here in Leviticus 5. So Levit Leviticus 5, so it's a, the guilt offering. Rams were given as a, an atonement for the guilt offering. And that's, that's what I was looking for. So... So I'm going to just read it here in Leviticus chapter 5, from verse 14. It says, Then Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, If a person acts unfaithfully and sins in unintentionally against Yahuwah's holy things, then he shall bring his guilt offering to Yahuwah, a ram without defect from the flock, according to your valuation in silver by shekels, in terms of the shekel of the sanctuary, for it is a guilt offering. He shall make restitution for that which he has sinned against the holy thing, and shall, shall add to it a fifth part of it, and give it to the priest. The priest shall then make atonement for him and the ram, with the ram of the goat offering, and it will be forgiven him. And so this is pretty much the same thing that we're reading about right now, but it's in the case of if somebody wrongs another person monetarily, monetarily in some way, he's to pay back what he... Uh, Pay back the damages, in other words, plus one fifth, plus twenty percent back. So again, here in Numbers chapter five, I'm going to start again in verse five. Then Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, "Speak to the sons of Israel: When a man or a woman commits any of the sins of mankind." acting unfaithfully against Yahuwah. And that person is guilty. Then he shall confess his sins which he has committed. And he shall make restitution in full for his wrong. And add one-fifth to it. And give it to him who he, whom he has wronged. And this is crazy. This is the second train to come by in like five minutes. I, I've been sitting out here for like a probably an hour and a half at least. And no train came by. Now that I heard. And now I'll start a video in the second train in five minutes. Come on, man. It says, Then he shall confess his sins which he has committed. First things first. And he shall make restitution in full and add one-fifth to it. And give it to him whom he has wronged. But if the man has no relative to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution is made, which which is made for the wrong, must go to Yahuwah, go to Yahuwah to the Lord, for the priest, besides the ram of atonement, by which atonement is made for him. Also, every contribution pertaining to all the holy gifts of the sons of Israel. Which they offer to the priest shall be his. So, so every every man's holy gifts shall be his. Whatever a man gives to the priest, they shall become his. And so, we first off we know that the the priests they they were the ones that made to make the offerings to God. They uh, they would. Offer the sacrifices to God, but of the sacrifices, they weren't all just burnt up on the altar. We've been through this in Leviticus, but, you know, there were different, depends on the type of sacrifices, the type of type of offerings, there were different, uh, different rituals, different ways that they were done, but in the case of almost every single one of them, uh, a certain portion of the animal or of, of the grain offering or whatever offering it was, was offered up to God. And then the rest was given to the priest as their food. And 
we see in this case. It says also, every contribution pertaining to all the holy gifts of the sons of Israel, which they offer to the priest, shall be his. And and this is, you know, this is more specifically in this case, like in the case of something like this. But but the priests also partook in the in all the all the offerings and sacrifices in some way. Except uh, except for one of them, I believe, because the the whole animal was burned in uh, the burnt offering, I believe. And now we're going to get into the part that I was speaking about earlier. Then Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, and a man has intercourse with her, and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband, and she is undetected, although she has defiled herself, and there is no witness against her, and she has not been caught in the act, if a spirit of jealousy comes over him, and he is jealous of his wife when she has defiled herself. Or, a, or if a spirit of jealousy comes over him, and he is jealous of his wife when she has not defiled herself. The man shall then bring his wife to the priest, and shall bring as an offering for her one-tenth of an ephah of barley meal. So that's actually two quarts, which is eight cups. So the man shall bring his wife to the priest and shall bring as an offering to, for her, basically eight cups of barley meal. As a grain offering. He shall not pour oil on it, nor put frankincense on it, for it is a grain offering of jealousy, a grain offering of memorial, a reminder of iniquity. So this was also, uh, you know, a, a type of offering in regards to this uh, this situation. If a man becomes jealous of his wife, thinking that she uh, cheated on him, whether she did or whether she didn't, this test would prove whether she did or whether she didn't. And if she did, God was the judge. As we're going to see, and there was punishment for it. Then the priest shall bring her near, and have her stand before Yahuwah, stand before the Lord, uh, there at the tent of meeting, there at the tabernacle. And the priest shall take the holy water, or shall take holy water, and I believe this is speaking about water, at least I don't see... I don't know what else would be considered holy water. I believe it's a water from the bronze laver that's there in front of the tabernacle for the for the washing of the priests before they minister to God. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthenware vessel, and he shall take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. So... You know, there's some people that claim, see, we haven't even gotten into what happens yet, but there's some people that claim that that this is uh, some type of chemical concoction that, uh, or, or that, uh, well, I'll save the, I'll save the other things that, that people think, I'll save those here in a minute, but some people think this is like some, some type of chemical concoction, some, some wicked thing. But it was only the the holy water with with dirt or dust from the floor of the tabernacle, wherever the tabernacle was at the time. You know, the tabernacle was moved around, and it was put into the water. The priest shall then have the woman stand before Yahuwah. Yahuwah and um. The Lord, 
It's God's name. The priest shall then have the woman stand before Yahuwah, or Yahweh, and let the hair of the woman's head go loose. And so, so, so women back then, this isn't a command necessarily from God to do this, but, you know, and, and, and you know, mo most, uh, although, you know, he Hebrew ladies cover their head, and, and l ladies that, you know, believe in keeping the Torah tend to cover their head, uh, cover their hair with a, you know, it could be a bandana, it could be, a, a, a lot of things. And the same thing, it's the same thing with, uh, Muslims, the women cover their head. You know, some go to the extreme and, you know, some, you know, there's, a uh, extremists and I'll say, I'll say this real quick, that extremist is the new terrorist. And this is all designed for a reason that they, they use these terms. I mean, for the, in the first place, like what, what is a terrorist in the first place, in the first place? You know, it's, uh, we were, this, see, with 9-11, we were given the idea of terrorism and terrorists. This is a terrorist. Oh, man, this is so deep. This is so deep because it was designed this, oh, my gosh, man. It was, oh, man. God has just shown. <laughs> it was designed like this the whole, whole time since back. Since 9-11-2001. Since 20 years ago. It was designed this way for a reason. To bring about this term. Terrorists. And terrorism. The war on terror. And they portrayed this picture. And if, if you still. I mean. 9-11 was an inside job. But it was done. In order to, oh man, it's so deep. It, it, see, see, myself and most others have 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 realized for a long time that it was an inside job, and it's uh, it wasn't because of Muslim terrorists that this happened. Um, but the unveiling didn't go too much further than that. I mean, besides, you know, all the details on how it happened, why it happened, you know, I mean, but this is just hitting me now. I believe God is revealing something to me major, something major to me right now in regards to this. Wow. So that's when they, so back then, that that's when they rolled out the whole, that's when they truly rolled out the whole idea of a terrorist. The whole term terrorist or terrorism. And they they gave it a, be, a very bad name. And name. Name means reputation. Or it means a couple of things, but reputation is one thing name means. Gave it a very bad name as these like as these crazy people. Who are just trying to kill? Who are just trying to kill people? Who are evil and wicked? Who are just trying to kill people for no reason? And that was the idea that was implanted in our minds here in America and around the world as to what a terrorist is. And now here in this last year, we've seen it on Facebook recently. We've seen on Facebook people getting notifications saying, "Um." Are you concerned, or, or you you may be following, you may be in contact with an extremist on here. See, extremism, extremist is the is the new terrorist. This was all designed. This was twenty years ago. They gave us twenty years to everybody to have everybody ingrained with the idea of what a terrorist is, and now now they're saying, see. Extremist is a new terrorist. It's their new term for the same thing. Extremist or extremism, terrorism, extremism. 
And so with extremism, that can go in a lot of directions. It's not just Muslim extremists who are in ISIS and and like suicide bombers and like stuff like that. What's coming and what is beginning already is the see this is this has been the, this has been the scheme all along and and I can't believe I mean this is amazing like uh the guy just revealed this to me this has been the scheme all along to get the whole world used to this idea of terrorism and then they switch it from terrorist to extremist and now these now they're going to they're gonna, I'll, I'll just say plainly they're going to eventually call Bible believing Christians and this eventually is coming soon very soon they're eventually going to call Bible believing Christians especially those who claim that we're in the last days which we you know look look around us we clearly are but Bible believing Christians who believe we're in the last days or who believe in conspiracy theories and that's a whole nother term and they've been working on that. They've been working on that term for what the last 50, 60 years. Back since JFK, they've been working on the term conspiracy theory. All working up to the point that we're at now, so that they can call people who believe in what they call conspiracy theories. I, mean, I can't believe I mean God is just revealing so much to me right now that they would it's all see the term conspiracy theory came around at the murder of JFK and they called who whoever questioned the official story about JFK they called a conspiracy theorist or they called them conspiracy theories and this term has been used here and there, all along, up up until now, until the days that we're living in. And, and here in these last couple years, they've been going real heavy with the term conspiracy theory or conspiracy, conspiracy theorist. Say, oh, and, and so anything they want to hide, anything they don't want the public to know, they just hide it under the guise, under the... Under conspiracy theory, they say, "Oh, if if some basically if somebody wakes up, if, if if somebody sees, has eyes to see and sees what what's truly going on, and says something about it, they say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory.' And they have agents that come, that that uh that are on Facebook, that are, in in everywhere." That'll come on and say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. And then, then they'll spread these posts saying, this is a conspiracy theory. And just in order to brainwash the masses, they'll have the news say, oh, this a conspiracy theory. Even presidents saying, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. In order to hide the truth. And they're about to, and they're already beginning to, they're using this QAnon thing to call conspiracy theorists extremists and that's what the whole capital thing was about that's what the whole capital thing was about labeling see see christian i mean trump's base you know it's, it's the the right wing of the republican but a lot of them a lot of trump supporters are christians and a lot of them are awake to the reality of a lot of these things a lot of them have eyes to see and they're and this capital thing at the beginning of this, of this year see this was set up as well this was set up like you know through antifa cia like i mean all the works all the gov all the agencies you know it's the works are working on this this was done 
I mean, I, it's just crazy. Uh, the guy was just revealing so much to me. I, I didn't mean to get off on such a rabbit trail, but like, this is important. This is crazy. This was done in January, January 6th, the, the rushing of the Capitol. This was done on purpose in order to call certain groups of people and they you notice how they labeled labeled them all uh, Q conspiracy theorists to label certain groups of people conspiracy theorists. Oh, uh, not I mean, well, first off, these people they labeled this group of people. They're already labeled as they labeled they labeled them like as as extremists and terrorists for rushing the capital. But they connect that with the the Q thing, which you know most people don't even follow this Q thing. I mean, it's, that's a psyop to begin with. That's all a part of the system too. That's all a part of this scheme as well. The the Q thing. It's all a deception from the enemy. But they lay, they connected the them rushing the capital. They called them extremists, terrorists even, but then connected that to the Q thing, to the conspiracy theory. So anybody to give off the idea and put forth this, this plan, this idea, that not only, well, the first that people who believe in these Q conspiracy theories, that term conspiracy theories are extremists, are terrorists. If you believe in conspiracy, conspiracy theory, now you're a terrorist. You know, you're an extremist. But like I said, a lot of Trump supporters. See, Trump, you know, and he, he's a part of all this as well. I'm not, I'm not going to get into him today. And I, Lord willing, maybe I'll do a, a video on who he is in Bible in the Bible prophecy. I mean, he's, he's a major player in Bible prophecy. I believe he's written in many scriptures, written about in many scriptures. So that's for another day, but but he's a part of it as well. And this was done. Many of his followers are Christian. That's and this is a big oh, this is such this is huge, man. This is such such a big reason. I mean, this is why he he built such a Christian base, such a Christian following. And a Jewish following. For this scheme right here. And not only for this scheme right here. But for the ultimate betrayal which is to come. Which he will be back in power. And he will be in power when the tribulation begins. And that's my understanding of Bible prophecy. That's what I believe God has shown me. But. But his first term in office. Was for. And see this is all a part of a plan. His first term in office. Was for that, for to get Christians and Jews on his side, and to form this, and for the cute, the whole. Oh man, yeah, just, just if you just go back to the beginning of his term, all the Q stuff that was coming out, all the conspiracy stuff that was coming out, all how he's gonna drain the swamp, Hillary, he's gonna throw Hillary and all these people, and Guantanamo, he's gonna drain the swamp. They put out this information. They put out this information on the, the pedophiles and all, all this wickedness for a reason. It's not, it didn't just leak. <laughs> they leaked it. They leaked it for a reason. To get this, to get the right, to get the Republicans, which many of whom are Christians and many of whom are waking up, to get them to see that all this stuff is being revealed. And when they go online and start talking about this stuff, even though it's true, when they go online and start talking about this stuff and talking about Jesus, it all came down to that point, January 6th at the Capitol, when it was turned against them. And now they're labeled extremists. Now they're labeled See, not terrorists, because they can't call them terrorists. 
But terror, but like I said, extremist is a new terrorist. Extremism is a new terrorism. It's a new term for the same thing. It's just a little bit lighter term. And this is all done for a reason to get the world and to get most people to turn against and to get to, to get people who are waking up to the truth, who understand the things that are going on, who are awake about the Illuminati and this, the pet, pedophilia, all this wickedness that's going on, who are awake about this stuff and who believe in the Bible. Both of them, first that, and well, first those who believe in the Bible and Christians, but also those who are awake to get them to be officially labeled in society as conspiracy, not only as conspiracy theorists, but as extremists, which is the new terrorists, in order that they can eventually take these people in, eventually take these people down for being so-called extremists or terrorists. See, we're living in the last days, and this is coming upon us real quick. But man, oh, I cannot believe how much God just revealed to me about the reality of all this and how they've been scheming for so long with the term conspiracy theory and with the, for 20 years with the term terrorist and just this year that with the term extremist and extremism. And oh man, oh my gosh. Oh man. I'll be surprised if I can even get this video out. They don't want this talked about. They don't want people awake like this. And I'm not saying I know everything I don't. But God, I believe God just <laughs> revealed to me majorly the schemes of the enemy in regard to these things here. Wow. Unbelievable. I mean, believable, but wow. That's crazy. But let's get back into Numbers 5 and finish this study up. So again, we're here talking about the woman caught in adultery or if the husband was jealous and thought she had uh, committed, uh, thought, she, thought she had cheated on him. But even if she didn't, this, this test was done. And, it, it was, and if she was, if she was guilty, then she would have a curse come upon her. If she was innocent, it would all be over. She would be proven innocent. So one more time from verse 16. And here comes another train. And this is uh This is something something they do. Uh, not that trains don't just come by here pulling stuff, but you know, the last like four nights in a row, and this this happens like almost all the time. The last four nights in a row, right when I get home, right when I pull in the driveway, start getting out of my car, the train comes by blowing the horn. Every time. This is done on purpose. I've seen them ride by in in single, in single uh, cabs or just pulling like three three cars or whatever, just riding by, riding back and forth, blowing a horn. And it's not just just to harass me, just for uh, the the mental thing, the gang stalking, because what gang stalking is is psychological warfare to try to break somebody's mind to make them freak out or to make them talk about it to make them sound crazy. But you, but y'all see, I mean, the last half an hour has been at least three trains come by. Like it, and it's excessive, but uh, but it's also done. You know what? I'll keep this other part to myself. It's also done for another reason, but I'll keep that other part to myself for right now. But uh, one reason it's done is for me. But another reason it's done is right when I get home for others, and I'll just leave it at that. But, uh, you know, we're living in a crazy time and our enemy has control of trains, planes, cars, the whole world. You know, the, the, the Bible says the whole world lies in the hands of the hands of the wicked one. Uh, Satan was able to offer Jesus all the kingdom, all the kingdoms of the world if, if he would serve them. And that's why all the rich and powerful people in the world serve him. And are doing his will. But God protects us. Who is greater? <laughs> it 
It's not even a question. Hallelujah. But anyway, let's continue on with this chapter. Then the priest shall bring her near and have her stand before Yahuwah, before the Lord. And the priest shall take the holy take holy water in an earthenware vessel. And he shall take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and pour it into the water. And I'll just say, uh, this is the last thing I'm going to say about it. Just interesting because uh, the last two times I mentioned it, see, there's a there's a train crossing up this way. Oh, maybe it's about to blow the horn. But there's a train crossing up this way, and there's a train crossing like right over here. And normally it's loud right here. And uh, but I can also hear it when they blow it over here, over there, and also at another crossing over here. But the last two seem to blow it down the road, but didn't even blow it when they cross. It was, you know, it's, it sounded off, definitely. But uh, sorry for that. Sorry for that interruption. Let's continue. Then the priest shall then have the woman stand before Yahuwah, and let the hair of the woman's head go loose. And so this is where I got into the uh, into that rabbit trail, because the letting loose of the hair. See, women would keep their hair covered, and still do, in a lot of societies, in, in Jewish and in he, Hebrew, uh, Bible-believing people be who believe in keeping the Old Testament law, uh, and Muslim societies, the women have their hair covered uh, in public, if, if they're married, more specifically. If the woman is married, she would have her hair covered, but if, if she's uh, single, uncovered, in order to show that she's available and we even see in the book of Genesis when Jacob or no is uh when Isaac first saw Rebecca Isaac the son of Abraham when he first saw his wife Rebecca well when she saw him because uh, Abraham's servant was bringing her to meet Isaac and she saw him and uh, I can't remember exactly what it was now. She either covered her head or uncovered her head when she saw him. You know, it's, uh, it's been a part of societies for a long time, but it's not a commandment of God. It's not uh, a requirement. It's more it's tradition. The priest, but it, again, it stands for and the uncovered hair, standing for the woman being available, and the covered hair being uh, being married. The priest shall then have the woman stand before Yahuwah, and let the hair of the woman's head go loose, and place the grain offering of memorial in her hands. So the grain offering, the, the four cups of, uh, or no, eight cups, two quarts, eight cups of, the barley meal and place the grain offering of memorial in her hands which is the grain offering of jealousy and in the hand of the priest is to be the water of the bitterness the water of bitterness that brings a curse so she's to hold the grain offering in her hands the barley meal and he has the water the priest shall have her take an oath and shall say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray into uncleanness, being under, being under the authority of your husband, be immune to this water of bitterness that brings the curse. If you, however, have gone astray, being under the authority of your husband, and if you have defiled yourself, and a man other than your husband has had intercourse with you. And this next sentence is actually added in. It's in parentheses. It says, Then the priest shall have the woman swear, swear with the oath of the curse. And the priest shall say to the woman, Yahuwah make you a curse and an oath. The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people. 
by Yahuwah is making your thigh waste away and your abdomen swell. So if the woman was found guilty, so basically if the, wo the woman would drink the water, which was just the holy water mixed with some dirt from the floor of the tabernacle, and she would have the grain offering in her hands, but the, the priest would give her the water, and we're going to get a little bit more into this here in a second. But if she was innocent, nothing would happen. She'd be declared as innocent. Uh, but if she was guilty, it's the, it says... It says the the Lord may, the Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people, by Yahuwah is making your thigh waste away and your abdomen swell, your thigh waste away and your abdomen swell. And so, I didn't do a major study into maybe maybe I will at some point. I didn't do a major study into what exactly this is. I don't know if we know. I don't know if it's a specific thing or a condition or. I believe it was just God's curse. So, so there's some people that say, there's some people that think, um, it's, there's some people that, based on different translations, some people think that this is speaking about abortion, God, God causing the woman to miscarry. And that's not the case. I, that, that's not the case. That's not it. Um, uh, and there's some other people that think that basically uh, the, th the thigh would says the thigh waste away and abdomen swell. Some people think that it would swell up and burst and the woman die. I don't think that's necessarily the case either. Um, I believe it was just a curse that she it would be a serious condition, whatever it was. But I don't think it would necessarily kill her, and I don't think it has anything to do with the miscarriage or abortion. I don't know exactly what it is, but this is my un current understanding and thoughts on this as to what it, what it actually was and wasn't. Mm. Helicopter about to come by. Maybe they didn't like what I was talking about. I don't care. So one more time. If you, however, have gone astray, being under the authority of your husband, and if you have defiled yourself, and a man other than your husband has had, had intercourse with you, Yahuwah make you a curse and an oath among your people by Yahuwah's making your thigh waste away and your abdomen swell. And the water that brings a curse shall go into your stomach and make your abdomen swell and your thigh waste away. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. So the woman is to agree to agree to uh, basically accept that curse if she's guilty or agree to be found innocent if she's not. So one more time, I do believe this was just uh this is just what it was with the the curse that God pronounced that the God this was God's judgment on on that woman that her thigh uh would waste away in some way whatever exactly that means and that her abdomen would swell there is I will say I will go to this one commentary real quick I was looking at a few commentaries on it uh, this one gives an idea. I don't know if this is, I don't know if this would be the case or not, but I just, uh, I'll just read what they put forth here. This commentary says it cannot be determined with any certainty what was the nature of the disease threatened in this curse. Michaelis supposes it to be dropsy of the ovary in which a tumor is formed in the place of the ovarium, 
which may even swell so as to con contain a hundred pounds of fluid, and with which the patient becomes dreadfully em emaciated. Josephus says, It is an ordinary dropsy. At any rate, the idea of the curse is this. The punishment shall come from the same source of this sin. So it's it's not completely determined what exactly this was, but I, I believe I mean I believe it's you know close to what the Bible describes: th thigh waste away, abdomen swell. I still I still hear this chopper coming. It's getting closer. It says, and the water that brings the curse shall go into your stomach and make your abdomen swell and your thigh waste away. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. The priest shall then write these curses on a scroll and wash them off into the water of bitterness. So the priest will write the curses about the thigh wasting away and the abdomen swelling on a scroll. And it says, wash them off into the water of bitterness. So I basically just dip the scroll I mean, it's my understanding of it. Basically, just dip the scroll into, into the water that she was going to drink. Basically, just washing up what he writ, what he wrote. Basically, uh, transferring the curse from the paper into the drink, and she would drink it. The priest shall then write these curses on a scroll, and he shall wash them off into the water of bitterness. Then he shall make the woman drink the water of bitterness that brings the curse, so that the water which brings a curse will go into her and cause bitterness. The priest shall, shall take the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand, and he shall wave the grain offering before Yahuwah and bring it to the altar. And so this is uh, another... So the, the wave offering, this was done in the, in the instance of peace offerings. In the case of peace offerings or free will offerings to God, not necessarily for a sin or guilt or, or just a free will offering. Uh, I mean, there's different types of peace offerings. There's free will offerings. There's uh, vow offerings, votive offerings. It has to do with vows. And in this case, it has to be, do with uh, uh, this is a jealousy offering. But it's a type of peace offering because it was uh, waved. That he would take the grain, the the barley meal, and wave it before God, and then take it to the altar. And the priest shall take the handful of the grain offering as its memorial offering. Well, let me just read this back one more time. The priest shall t then take the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand, and he shall wave the grain offering before Yahuwah, and bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the grain offering as its memorial, as its memorial offering, and offer it up in, on smoke in smoke on the altar. And afterward, he shall make the woman drink the water. So he would take the grain offering. He had the, the cup of water. She had the, she had the grain offering. Uh, he would take the grain offering from her, wave it to God, offer up a, mo a memorial portion, not the whole thing. A certain portion and then the rest of it was for the priest to eat so he would offer up a certain portion and then he would have the rest to eat for himself and then it says and then then he shall make the woman drink the water of bitterness that brings the curse and actually I jumped back then he shall make afterward he shall make the woman drink the water when he has made her drink the water, then it shall come about if she has defiled herself and has been unfaithful to her husband, that the water which brings the curse will go into her and will cause bitterness. And bitterness is also interesting. The water of bitterness. And uh, this comes down to wormwood. Wormwood that we see in book, the book of Revelation, which represents Satan. Uh, wormwood we see in a couple other scriptures that, too. You know, the worm, Wormwood means bitterness.
if she has defiled herself and has been unfaithful to her husband, that, that the water which brings the curse will go into her and cause bitterness. And, uh, oh man, it's just, you know, it's completely still in line with, I mean, it's prophetically, if, if you're in sin, if you're found guilty, it's going to cause bitterness. God and the prophets says, I will feed this people wormwood, bitterness, the bitter water, uh, because of their sins. And wormwood in Revelation is, is speaking about Satan. Uh, a great star falling from heaven this is the the third, the second or third trumpet. A uh, great star falling from heaven named Wormwood, and it fell on a third of the waters. What waters represent people? It fell on a third of the people. It says that the waters became Wormwood. Not only became bitter, but became Wormwood. Wormwood is Satan. That the water that brings the curse will go into her and cause bitterness. And her abdomen will swell and her thigh will waste away. And the woman will become a curse among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, then she will, then she will be free and conceive children. And so I guess if uh, she has defiled herself and her, her abdomen swelled and her thigh wasted away, she would not be able to conceive based on the effects of that. What exact, whatever exactly it was. It says, But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, then she will be free and conceive children. This is the law of jealousy. When a wife, being under the authority of her husband, goes astray and defiles herself, or when a spirit of jealousy comes over a man, and he is jealous of his wife, he shall then make the woman stand before Yahuwah, and the priest shall apply all this law to her. Moreover, the man will be free from guilt, but the woman shall bear her guilt. And that's the end of Numbers chapter 5. Number 6, I guess we'll get into tomorrow, unless God leads me to do another one tonight. But, uh, again, if you... I'm, you know, my mind is kind of blown on how much, uh, I mean, God had already re revealed a lot to me concerning what I talked about, uh, like 10, 15 minutes ago, but, whew, it just gave me the picture and hopefully you guys can see it. But once again, pray for my father. He's, uh, actually right now. Wow, it's 1129 right now on the East Coast. He's supposed to be getting into the transport right now. It just turned to 1130. Wow. I mean, right when I speak about it, he's supposed to be transported. From what I heard, he's supposed to be transported from uh, the urgent care to the hospital at 1130. It's 1130 right now. So uh, pray for my father. His name is Darren. Uh, pray for his healing. Pray for the infection to be destroyed, to be, to disappear, to not spread in the body. And for him to be healed completely. And also, again, pray for Josiah, who was in a car accident. That's the end of Numbers chapter 5. Brothers and sisters, let's stay strong in faith. Let's endure to the end no matter what we have to go through here in these last days. Let's stay focused on God. Let's be prepared for the return of the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. He's going to bring judgment upon this world. Serious judgment. But he will save his people. Are you one of them? Let's make sure we're abiding in him. We abide in him. We love him by keeping his commandments. Let's walk in all the ways of God. Let's serve Him with all our heart. And do His will in all things. Let's shine His light. We shine His light by showing His love, by preaching the gospel, and by living out His word. Let's shine His light. And as a matter of fact, that I mean, that is how we do it. But we can't shine His light. We can't shine His light. We are the lamps. We are the candlesticks. We can't shine His light without the oil. 
The oil is the Holy Spirit. We need His Spirit in us and working in us to produce that light. Let's shine His light. Let's make sure we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's shine His light. Let's show His love. And let's do His will in all things. Let's serve Him with all our heart. And love is the most important thing. And most important is to love God. And we love Him by, you know, it's all based on love. It's all based on loving God. See, and when we love some, when we love our neighbor, we're loving God. Loving God is the most important commandment, and everything is based on that. All the law is based on loving God. Hallelujah. And I never looked at it like that. I always looked at it like love at the top. Like if you look at it like a chart, love at the top. Under that, there's love God and then love our neighbor. Then under that, the Ten Commandments. Then under that, the rest of the law. But it's actually love. Love God. Then love our neighbor or love God and love our neighbor. But loving God is the most important thing. That's the number one commandment. And when we love our neighbor, we are loving God. So it's love, love God, love our neighbor. Ten commandments, the rest of the law. This is all based on love. It's all based on loving God. So let's love God. Let's serve Him with all our heart. Let's seek Him with all our heart. Let's be ready. And uh, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, turn to Him. Give your life to Jesus today. Repent and believe the gospel. There's not much time left. And that's the end of Numbers chapter 5. Shabbat Shalom to everybody out here keeping Sabbath. Let's just take it easy. Rest Friday night to Saturday night. Rest. Set it apart to God. Just don't do any work. And rest. Simple as that. And... I feel like as soon as I end this video, this helicopter is going to come by. I've been hearing it for the last, it's close by. I've been hearing it for the last, like, 15 minutes. And I think right when I end the video, it's going to come by just as a, a message or something. Just a message to me or something. But they don't want it on video. At least that's what it seems like to me. That's probably the case. But I can't stay on here all day. All night. Let me go ahead and end the video. But I do believe in the next two, three minutes, once I end the video, the helicopter is going to fly right by me or over me. But love you guys. Shalom.